Our next speaker today, uh, and today's last speaker, is Osa Fredel, who will talk about uh, Indo-European rock art. Societies 
were made throughout through trade, exchange and travels. Um, I also, before I give you some examples of my work uh, with this as a background, I also want to empathize that there is a difference, an uh, important difference in a literate society, in a pre-literate society. In a literate society, change is transparent as memory the awareness of past ideas becomes fixed, objectified, and unlimited in preserved text. You become an observer of many possible worlds where origin of a society is a cultural construction, but dependent, of course, of the idea of becoming, of being conceived of as something natural. Origin is often tied up with the creation of identity. Therefore, time transforms into something measurable, Time is specialized, and as a result, the question of origin and dispersal becomes more central. And now we put this in contrast to the, to the time we are actually studying in a pre-literate society, an oral tradition. Within an oral tradition, change is not as transparent as memory is manipulated, fluid, subjectified, and limited whilst tied to persona, speech, and pictures. Time is more fluid, and you live participating the world. Tradition is conservative, and change is often slow and initiated from within. The new is often created in a relation or as a comment upon the already existing structures. The question of origin, dispersal, was not important. Instead, it was important to make the foreign familiar. And in this point, um, we have specialized time against vitalized time, and sometimes we forget this because we ask, we ask questions from our interests, and we forget that society has changed, and the archaeological material that we have to investigate is just a fraction parts it's not a complete material, and uh, uh, when we write, uh, the written material really changes our way of thinking, and uh, we should be open uh, to other ways of thinking about time, especially when we investigate this kind of material. I will show you why. <coughs> As we today are members in a, in a literate society, in a world with a constant increased literacy, we tend to specialize time. There is a recent theoretical discussion that calls, a need, calls for a need to revitalize time in order to receive a more balanced archaeology and to open up for new interesting mythologies and interpretations where fluidity and movements within and not only between categories are put forward. This calls for a new way of treating and thinking about the archaeological source material, not just as something stat static and clearly defined, but as something that with the interaction of man com can become fluid and manipulated over time. These flows and movements between, past, between the past and the present and the future in the past society and between past societies are exhibited in rock art and pictures, being perhaps the material closest to language and literature in oral societies. Prehistoric man actively created, manipulated, as well as reflected upon time in their time, and these processes left distinguishable traces in the archaeological material. <coughs> I will now turn to some examples, so, so, you, follow, follow what, so you can follow what I mean with this. What I'm saying really is that uh, the archaeological material, uh, we should look upon it as um, the pictures with a cl close relation to, to speech as it can change with time. Okay, I will give you just a few examples, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to go into details of them, but uh, there are some materials here, if you're interested, you can, you can read them in detail afterwards. Um, some narratives is, a, for example, themes, compositions, there are scenes and there are attributes. These are not complete, of course, they, I can put them before and put gestures, I've been studying that too, and they are not neither exclusive. Uh, an attribute can be used uh, in a scene that can be put in a theme, of course, and 
there are also subtypes of these different themes. A theme can have different subtypes. Scenes have subtypes and attributes also. There can be bodily attributes, there can be a geographical, and so on. I will now turn to one of these examples. I, first, I want to say that it's, it's been, when I try to read text and look at the material, you have to be aware that you should always start with the material, not, not text, because the material is much older than the text there is often a vari variation before it becomes uh, fixed in the text. So you should not look for a complete, um, complete, uh, complete uh, uh, where there is the same. Mm. Uh, one of these interesting things that I actually did find uh, is uh, an example of a scene. It's a synoptic scene. And of course, these are more difficult to find, uh, being close, closely related to speech and the oral tradition. The scenes more common are monosthenic scenes, where it's, uh, it's a kind of effective use of a, when you pack pictures into the rock, it's time consuming work. <laughs> and you want to normally, uh, if, you, if you have a central scene, perhaps where two people are fighting, you can use that scene for so many different narratives and stories. But if you, if you add details, attributes, um, a geographical attribute, bodily attributes, you fix, you fix the pictures more. So unfortunately for, for me and for us, the, the monocenic scenes are the most used ones because they were most flexible and uh, in, uh, to use in rock art. And the series are often they are a different kind of uh, uh, a series is used to uh, identify where an important change is taking part in a limited time. So uh, they are not used that often. But anyway, I'd like to illustrate for you uh, this one. I will read it and then I will comment on some of the pictures. When you, uh, of course, <laughs> rock art is not, doesn't look like this, <laughs> not at all. Uh, you have to investigate really closely on the site uh, to see what pictures can be contemporary and the chronology, chronology is very important. This is an exceptional site because you have uh, pictures on top of uh, all the pictures. So I, I could say that this, is quite late. It, it probably is 200 BC or zero. Uh, it is later than you have a four-wheeled wagon underneath. With a, this is a late, uh, and also you have a chariot with two wheels and the horse seen from the side. Uh, that's also quite late, and uh, and you have to work with proximity and the shapes and everything before you can conclude that they are uh, made at the same time, these pictures. And also this is difficult because the pictures are manipulated. There are so many um, examples of this where they have used all, all pictures and added some details uh, to make it, to refresh it and to put it into another story, so to, so to speak of. But these pictures, uh, the figures that are made darker gray are the ones that are Temporary, made at the same time. And it's quite late also because there are not so many ship figures in this, uh, this rock, rock carving. I'm sure you, you're familiar with this story. It's a prehistory to the, the Tame. I, I, I cannot pronounce the, the names properly, I guess, <laughs> since I'm not a linguist or a specialist in this. But I will read it and then I will, I will highlight the pictures that, that is being used. And as a synoptic scene, um, the definition of this is that there are uh, details in the story that are put together in one picture, so to speak of. There are modern examples of this. There could be a, a movie poster where they put uh, the, head, the head characters in the movie and some important events and so on in the same uh, 
this is a synoptic thing. Okay, I think you will you will understand um, how I how I try to illustrate this. There was a very rich landlord in Ulster, Grunjuk MacAgnomain. He lived in a lonely place in the mountains with all his sons. His wife was dead. Once, as he was alone in the house, he saw a woman coming toward him there, and she was a fine woman in his eyes. She settled down and began working at once, as though she were well used to the house. When night came, she put everything in order without being asked. Then she slept with Grunjuk. She stayed with him for a long while afterward, and there was never a lack of food or clothes or anything else under her care. Soon a fair was held in Ulster. Everyone in Ulster, men and women, boys and girls, went to the fair. Grunjuk uh, set out for the fair with the rest, in his best clothes, clothes and in great vigour. It would be as well not to grow boastful or careless in anything you say, the woman said to him. That isn't likely, he said. The fair was held. At the end of the day, the king's chariot was brought onto the field. His chariot and horses won. The crowd said that nothing could beat those horses. I will leave the story and explain, and explain why this uh, is a chariot, okay? There are uh, depictions of the horses and wagons in, uh, in rock art. Uh, this is a, a light wagon. It has no superstructure. There are wagons with superstructures. There are fighting chariots. There are often two or three persons uh, in, in those wagons, in those chariots. One who is driving and the other ones with uh, weapons. And uh, the lack of superstructure, the person being one, and also possibly holding something in his hand, a whip or a cloth or something. Cloths are often used to start off chariot races. I will continue. My wife is faster, Krunig said. He was taken immediately before the king and the woman was sent for. She said to the messenger, it would be a heavy burden for me to go and free him now. I am full with child. Burden, the messenger said. He will die unless you come. She went to the fair and the pangs clasped her. She called out to the crowd, a mother bore each one of you, help me. Wait until my child is born, but she couldn't move him. Very well, she said. A long-lasting evil week will come out of this on the whole of Ulster. What is your name? The king said. My name and the name of my offspring, she said, will be given to this place. I am Maka, daughter of Seinrith Mac Inbaith. Then she raised the chariot. As the chariot reached the end of the field, she gave birth um, alongside it. She bore twins, a son and a daughter. The name and main Maka, the twins of Maka, comes from this. Okay, I will explain <laughs> the picture. This is a, the, it's a gest, there are two gestures combined in this picture. And this is the, the gesture of the legs separated seen from the front. Uh, it is uh, a gesture of giving birth, often connected to, to female figurines. There is another one, and there is a, a man take, grasping her hand, her wrist. This is a common gesture, also in Greek material. It's the bride taking gesture, or that they belong together. And the third gesture is the pain. Uh, these outstretched hands, there is a difference if there is a 90, <laughs> uh, 90 uh, angle, the angle is 90 or 45 uh, uh, degrees. The cut mark, uh, you can explain with so many things in rock art, but uh, probably it's related to the context of the picture, so you have to, to think it's below, below the woman, it could be like a verb of giving birth or something. It could also be a symbol for the child or 
uh, there is actually is a damage to the rock. There could be two two cutbacks from the first. It's impossible to say because if uh, if the damage is done, then the whole uh, pecked area is gone. There is not no, nothing left. So it's impossible. Yeah. <coughs> that could be. Okay, I will continue. As she gave birth, she screamed out that all who heard that scream would suffer from the same pangs for five days and four nights in their times of greatest difficulty. This affliction ever afterward seized all the men of Ulster. And this you see, it's not just the woman, it's also the men. <laughs> that you can see there, there are men, some of his... Uh, phallic two of them at least and they have uh, the same uh, gesture of pain and then the, uh, okay I forgot sorry <laughs> this affliction ever afterwards seized all the men of Ulster who were there that day and nine generations after them five five days and four nights for five nights and four days, uh, the pangs lasted. For nine, uh, for nine generations, any Ulster man in those pangs had no more strength than a woman in the bed of labor. And in the last picture, you have uh, perhaps uh, an illustration of the man of Ulster, the, 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 where you have fully pecked out shields, or uh, not pecked out shields, representation of day and night. Uh, they are seen on circles, symbols also. Uh, that could be sun, moons. So that is possible. Um, they have swords and they are towards the same size so they are warriors. Uh, it could be an illustration of a man of Ulster. Anyhow, uh, a colleague of mine also said that uh, if you take into account the foot, foot soles here, this could also not be a narrative, it could just be an illustration of the uh, 1st of August, there is a feast uh, held for the, for, uh, for the god Lug, who is, uh, as you know, uh, very skilled, he has the, tri the, the three finger of, or the five finger hand, is the divine shoemaker, so in the foot could be a symbol of that. And this feast is often uh, held, uh, there are uh, racing chariots, and it, it's also a, the returning home of warriors for harvest time. So there are several elements that could uh, also be indicating this. I will continue with a completely different <laughs> I have three fields, you could say, that I have been investigating, and I, I don't have the time to, to go into detail for these now. So perhaps I will skip and I will give another example of a, an article that um, I wrote with um, a colleague when I did my postdoc in Spain, uh, Marco Garcia Quintela. I'm sure he's familiar to some of you. He was, the professor, uh, he was the professor of the, the Department of Historical Studies and he's very interested in uh, mythology, Iron Age mythology. And he came to me and said, what about this phallic knees? And I, I laughed at him and said, what about them? <laughs> I haven't seen them. And he said, said to me, oh, I, I saw one in, when I visited Balkan Monica and I'm sure you have them in <laughs> Boeslam. So I, I started to look for them. I said, okay, I promise I, I will go through a lot of material and see if there is phallic knees. <laughs> and um, it resulted that I found perhaps, first we thought perhaps it's a mistake that they have uh, mapped uh, the, the phallus further down or something like that. But I investigated and I found 35 examples and uh, it turned out that they were 
very much. There were subtypes. <laughs> I found that I could structure them into subtypes. And uh, the subtypes that I found are in the, in the middle. I don't know if I can point or... Oh, I can use this. Because he had material. This was the start of the investigation. It was a hypothesis that um, it was in time quite close. This is from Valka Monica, where you have the, the, the thing, or phallic, <laughs> from the knee, and it was related to this paleta that are found known from the, from the area here. With also with this symbol, of course, which most of you know. And this is from Tossene, um, it's in Bohuslän, southern part of Bohuslän, where you have the same representation of similar figure. And what I found was that they're all within this, the same time range and they, they had gestures. Uh, the persons with the phallic knees also uh, had the same type of a winged sword cape. They had the same gestures with their arms and they were often found, always found in the warrior fertility context of the pictures. And this became very interesting because it was a detail that we have at or even taking as a had if it had a meaning. <laughs> but we found them in the first A, you can see there is a over exaggeration of the knee. And in B there is a the snake connected to the knee. And in number in C there is the the bound between two people uh, between knees. And there were also variants that aren't found anywhere else, but there were big, large size figures with uh, ships that bounded their lower bodies or, and hips or knees together. Uh, this is interesting because there are no examples of this um, where ships are behind or connected with the upper body or the head. There should be if there is just a coincidence that they are, but they are always connected. And they even play with the interplay with the ship stem. Uh, being a phallus or a sword. There are also marked knees and uh, interesting also is that I think it was in, uh, it's a phenomenon located in the, in southern uh, Bohuslän. Uh, we did statistical analysis and you can read about them in this book if you're interested. There was a small detail that nobody had cared about because we can't understand understand it. But when we started to compare it with uh, what he knew about um, snakes or uh, phallic knees in uh, Greek and Gallic uh, texts and literature, there was a very interesting uh, coming out of this. What, what I was really there to, sorry, how long? Two minutes left. <laughs> okay, I will conclude that. Um, I was there to study this sun deer, and they were interesting because we've been speaking a little bit about the trade uh, and possible connections. And uh, the sun deer, I also made statistical analysis, but uh, to my surprise, I found uh, almost a complete. Um, copy <laughs> of a series that is uh, found in Montegurita, Barmanza in Galicia and in southern Bohuslän. The thing, this is like uh, Adam told you about that there has to be a complex set of, uh, uh, in, to investigate, you can't just take one picture and say, oh, we have a, a sun symbol here and there's a sun symbol there so we can uh, connect them, but here is a it's a quite complicated, there is a series with two compositions that is repeated with a stag and a doe in front of it. Um, below here you have the sun symbol, it's tied to the, to the stag. And on the upper, upper one, it has moved position and is now connected to the doe who is entering the sun, sun symbol with his front legs. And in Bohuslän, you have the same. Uh, exactly the same composition and the series is in the same. They are on the same side of, of the panel uh, to the west, put to the west.
western side, so to speak, of against the, towards the sea. And there are so many similarities that can't be can't be a coincidence. They are also made in the local context. This is the way they they make stags and deers in Galicia. They always have the spikes interior, so to speak, of. And in Iceland, they are always on the outside or mixed. So, and this is the local way of making the bodies of the deer. So, the, lo the people that were local made these. But the possibility is that somebody saw, saw it or that it was depicted on other type of materials, of course. But the interesting thing is that you have a local, a very old local mine, the tin mine, just 17 kilometers from this site. Uh, it was used in the 1890s and there were all traces of uh, working in this mine. They said it belong, It was used in Phoenician times, but this is just uh, a couple, uh, 200 years before these pictures may be dated, so perhaps there were even older use of this mine. And there are also the sun horse. The, in, in Sweden you only find the, the sun deer in Bohuslän, only in the southern and the central part of Bohuslän. There are no sun deers, there are sun horses. Uh, you find 30 of them around in Bohuslän. They are exactly the same, you can compare to, um, to uh, uh, racers, where there are sun horses coming down with the sun. There are rock carvings, exactly the same position, but with, it, with the, the difference that it, they use the deer instead. And in uh, Galicia, you have on the both sides of this fjord, where the tin mine is loca located uh, in the, by the end of the fjord, you have uh, two sun horses. There are only three sun horses in the whole of Galicia. So there are foreign elements in both, you can say. That, uh, this makes it interesting. Um, you might ask why did they bring sun, the sun deer to Bohuslän, when they had already had the sun horse and it was fine, it worked in their mythology and everything. And why are there sun horses in, in a place where there are only sun deer? Um, so my explanation of this is perhaps that people travelled. And you have here another synoptic scene, I won't talk of this, you can read. <laughs> to come to my conclusion. That there is a need to conduct comparative studies from the perspective of vitalized time and study fluidity and change, what is old and what is new within local categories. Finding similarities and differences within the narrative is very important. Rock art was made within the local oral tradition over a long period. Therefore, it becomes an excellent archaeological material to study change and the becoming of narratives and societies. I believe a shift to more balanced archaeology, in which time is more vitalized, uh, will prove to be so much more rewarding in understanding how past oral societies interacted with material culture. If we specialize time and archaeology too much, we are at high risk just reproducing our own contemporaneous, our own, own contemporaneous structures and needs in the story of our past. So. My, to conclude, uh, the question of inheritance and contacts, the material I'm studying, there was um, the inheritance is already there in the European, you can see, but there are also contacts between these in European speaking societies, and they borrow from each other, and they know uh, and they appreciate other stories, other narratives. Uh, and probably they're also interchanging with the languages and the people. It's not too hard to learn a new language, especially not if the language is similar to your own. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
in Scandinavia we have a, the only, we have a, a good reference in time because there are so many bronzes that have pictures on them and they are quite almost sim the, almost the same uh, as, as the on the rocks there are ships there are animals there are the sun horses um, so of course there are more pictures on the rocks <laughs> But uh, t topology is uh, is what we use mainly. But also you can you can correlate to uh, gestures. I think is very valuable uh, because you have them. Uh, they are so uh, locked in time. Or what to say? There are objects with a sword, with a winged cape, for example. Uh, objects like uh, helmets, swords, uh, shields that you find as archaeological material. Uh, uh, you can, you have the, later in pre-Roman era, and she has little square uh, shields. You can see the use of horses, for example, from uh, the sun horse. Uh, in Bohuslän, it's very clear that you start to, with the time of, uh, of Bronze Age, uh, you start to domesticate horses much more, uh, probably breeding of horses. See pictures where a stag and a, no, sorry, it's not stag, <laughs> where a stallion and the and the um, what do you call it, mare, <laughs> they are put together and they are very empathized. You have mares with big, big, big stomachs and all this, and you have also uh, hordes of horses, and these are quite late. The topology of the horse changes over time from being very slender and tall to becoming smaller and less in style. Uh, it sounds not so uh, good, <laughs> but uh, it's really, if you have, a, if you work with this material a lot, and also if you go out and in, in feel and see it, you start to uh, appreciate this, that you can use really, you can say when it was made, more or less if it's late or early, Bronze Age, if it's Iron Age, there are some details. And then you have to work with the context and move it, uh, compare pictures from different places and everything like that. So it's like a big red of, <laughs> but by the end you have a small, you have a percent. But of course, when uh, something may turn up, uh, say that you have to work in another way, uh, they can be early. was really fascinated, fascinated by how you can relate the, uh, the tarn to the uh, rock carvings. Mm. Uh, but you only related it to one layer, of course, uh, that's natural. Well, I, I'm curious, uh, can you relate other narratives to the other layers found on that rock, or in other works? Um, I haven't looked at the other, the other layers, no. Okay. Uh, but I have found another synoptic scene. Mm. <laughs> Actually, when we were looking for this uh, phallic knees, uh, there was another possible uh, scene I can just show you. It's very short. <laughs> and this, this is the normal way of late rock, uh, rock uh, smaller panels. We have the complete composition. You have no interruption of uh, older images or anything. Okay. So it's easier, but uh, this is uh, one example that could be a synoptic scene. Here is it. A myth from Athens amplifies the creation of power of Athena's thigh. Uh, one of the versions of the birth of Erictonius tells us how Hephaestus wanted to seduce Athena. She resisted, but the now excited god ejaculated on her thigh. <laughs> Athena soaked up the god's semen with a cloth, which she then wrung out over the earth, leading to the birth of Erictonius who she then took care of and from which the Athenians received the name of the goddess. Um, uh, this could be, this is just to show you that this is like phallic knee. <laughs> uh, this is a woman. The, the ponytail is classical in rock art in Scandinavia to, to point out a woman. And uh, the phallic knee has like a line coming from it. <laughs> And the, 
you can see her the position of her leg is that of birth again, the, the feet are turning out, and she turns to her thigh, and perhaps there, there is something is impossible to, to tell, of course, but it is. <laughs> it could be like a cloth that she, she wants out, and there is also the cup mark under under the symbol. There is another one that sometimes they use to strengthen as an uh, as a symbol uh, or attribute of the of the scene. Of course, this is not a, this is the beginning of the Athenians. I'm not saying that, it, but perhaps there was a, an earlier story of something of the same that, the, that there was a, where the earth was the womb and the, the semen returned. So I'm not saying that the text or the stories. My point is to show that this uh, rock art, this rock art, you can actually uh, use use them in a different way, not just as illustri uh, illustrations, but uh, they could um, relate them to language or oral tradition, to narrative stories. You can put them. Uh, this is the way they could have worked, not necessarily exact the same story or. My, my research has shown that uh, I have I see more and more <laughs> when I work. I haven't seen anything that oh no, this uh, destroys my theories. <laughs> but I have discovered more and more, <laughs> and I haven't I haven't had time to do anything really in the last couple of years. So I don't know. We have the question from Christian. Christian. The first time I sent this when I was working in Spain, I got the answer back. They laughed at me and said they couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't go by boat at this time. <laughs> this was the final answer, <laughs> and this made me think, what? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I think they did. We we can't find all the evidence. We can't find perhaps the boats, but we will one day. We will find the boat. We haven't. I just want to make one comment that, uh, and maybe this just reflects the fact that you might find whatever you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the eight figures at the top of the first scene, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in uh, Dorcas's paper this morning, uh, there's a grave, and uh, St. Pasha buried the grave in the steps, that has eight uh, boys uh, buried in the same grave. We were relating that possibly to the initiation of mm. uh, boys into warriors. I, I don't know if that number will repeat itself. I'm going to start looking for it. Um, but you have eight figures up there. Uh, one of them is differentiated by carrying something that the others are not carrying. Uh, there was one of these uh, eight that was in the grave uh, that had two strands of dog's teeth. That's good, that, that was my aim. And actually I want to say that most of this material is, uh, rock art is, uh, what can you say, simplistic. You can, everybody see, see what they see and can, uh, can interpret it. But <laughs> you can also become very specialized in this and you can, there are so many complex uh, theories and uh, it is a great deal of work before you even start to connect different figures on it's a great step just to know that these pictures have been uh, manipulated and, and uh, used for different. And this is the way we use pictures as communication. I can find Snow, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, perhaps if I wanted, but that's, the, that's the, uh, also the strength of the pictures, that they use, they use them without being too... This is the difference between a text and a picture picture you can use for so many different stories and in an oral tradition this is an asset so the, these synoptic scenes where there are more uh, attributes that specialized story or uh, bodily attributes or uh, giving identity to the geographical attributes that could 
close and narrow in the story. These are, you are going to find less of them, not so many. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we'll stop now. Thank you.